love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a tra scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole Though stretch from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. I'd like you to take your Bible and open with me to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to look uh, at the 13th chapter and begin reading in the 24th verse of the book of Mark. We're going to talk about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. I uh, had a conversation with a uh, a particular person that was asking questions about the coming of the Lord and she was asking questions about the Antichrist and a lot of different subjects and so I, I tried to give her an answer and uh, ask her to go back and look at some hear some of the sermons we have recorded on the second coming of Christ exposition of Revelation and the book of Daniel but today in, in Mark 13, uh, we're going to talk about some of the practical applications dealing with the return of the Lord Jesus. Let me say unequivocally that I believe as, as much as I understand and know with my heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. He came the first time just as was promised. And He's coming again the second time even though he's made various appearances through the scriptures as a pre-manifestation of Christ, but uh, he's going to come in glory and power, and he's going to destroy this world as we know it, and he's going to receive his people to himself. Amen. Here in Mark chapter 13, uh, the Bible tells us, beginning in verse number 24, uh, these particular words. It says, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Now, there are a number of reasons why I cannot be a preterist uh, who believes that all of Matthew 24 and Mark 13 is history because there are applications that are made here to things that have not happened yet. Uh, there are many things that have been fulfilled in history in 70 A.D. But uh, these things such as then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. We know that he manifested himself on the Mount of Transfiguration, and there was Moses and Elijah, but that's not 
referring to the depth of what this passage is referring to. And it says, Then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So all of the saved, the elect, from those who are on earth and those who are in heaven who've already been upon this earth and have died and gone to be with the Lord are going to be reunited. And he tells us they'll be gathered from the four winds or north, east, south, and west. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth the leaves, you know that summer's near. Here's an application with uh, the plants and fruits that they had there in the Middle East, and the fig tree was one that they uh, had great use for, and it was a, a fruit to eat, and they would notice how it would uh, grow and produce fruit. And he said, you know, you understand about all of those things, so ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the door, doors. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And in that generation that uh, uh, lived during the time of Christ, they saw many miracles, they saw uh, many great and wondrous things that the Lord Jesus Christ performed while He was upon the earth. And He says, "In heaven and earth shall pass away, but My words shall not pass away. But of that day... And that hour knoweth no man. That day and that hour, meaning when the Lord Jesus returns, only the Father, as far as the Scripture tells us, knows when that time will come. Right. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the, man, the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Amen. Dear Father, please bless your word. Help me, Lord, to be able to be a blessing. I understand that there's nothing new under the sun. And someone has preached messages like this many times. But Lord, you tell us that we need to hear sermons on the coming of Christ. We need to read it in our Bible because it keeps us watching, it keeps us alert, and it gives us hope for the, the glorious return of our Savior. And Lord, we, we know that people should be ready. And if there's someone here in our number that's not ready, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will deal with their heart and bring conviction to their soul and grant to them repentance and faith so that they might be saved. I pray your blessings now upon the sick. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus is coming again. He's coming personally, and He's coming vis visibly. He told his, the angel told the disciples in the book of Acts that this same Jesus that you see taken from you shall so come again in like manner as you saw Him go. So He's coming again. It will be personal. It will be physical. And He will return with power and glory. He will come back to consummate His redemptive mission and to establish His eternal kingdom. Christians and Bible-believing people may disagree on different details surrounding the end times, but on this we can agree. Jesus is coming again. And as we explore this uh, passage in Mark 13 and other passages like that, let me remind ourselves that 
the primary purpose of the Bible's teaching on the coming of Christ is not to just satisfy curiosity, but rather it is to reveal how we ought to live in the light of the future events and the coming of our Lord. As we read through Mark 13, we saw the exhortation continually. Be alert, watch out, be on guard, be awake. Especially the final verse of the chapter, Jesus said uh, that uh, what I say unto you, I say to all or to everyone, watch, be ready, be prepared. And the Greek word translated to stay uh, alert or awake or watch is the last word of the chapter and Jesus' final word on the subject it is the emphasis lying in Mark 13. The theme of Scripture reminds us that Christ is coming and the Scriptures are not silent on how to be prepared. Amen. Number one, I would say in light of what we've just read from this beautiful passage that we should live in the light of His first coming. There was a time some 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was sinless, spotless Son of God, God in flesh, who came to this world, lived a perfect life, never committed one sin, tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He was nailed to a cross. Uh, he could have stopped it had He wanted, but He surrendered Himself. He was nailed to the tree. After he died, he was placed in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, he arose from the dead. He was seen by many, many witnesses, and history makes it clear that this is not a theory, this is not a fairy tale, this was real, and it is so real that it ought to excite us to no end to know that our Lord is coming. There's a, an illustration that Jesus uses uh, concerning uh, the uh, coming of the Lord that I think we would do well to look at in the, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. I'd like to read a few verses there. Luke 19, verse 11 through 27. Chapter 19, verse 11 through 27. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants, delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, Having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, uh, well thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little. Have thou authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. He said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is the pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an astute man, thou takest up that thou layest not down. Now, uh, the Lord is, is serious and honest, but He's not mean or unjust, which this man seems to imply. Uh, and He says, And reapest thou uh, didst not sow. Reapest that thou didst not sow. And He said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest that I was an astute man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. Now, for the purpose of 
just giving this man an argument, it seems that he agrees with him to a certain point. And he says, if I had been that way, why had you not used what you had to be faithful in the things that I had given to you? All of us as God's people have been given certain gifts and qualities that we can use for the honor of God. We're all different. We have different abilities. But each of us are unique. And God wants each of us to use our lives and our talents and whatever we may possess to give Him glory and to share the gospel and to live a life pleasing to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord says unto the man in verse 25, They said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, uh, bring hither and slay them before me. So this is a very serious parable that Jesus uses to explain that we're accountable and we're responsible to live our lives. Even though we're saved by grace, we're kept by grace, we ought to live our lives all the more faithfully to honor the Lord and to make His name known among our family and our children and the generations to come that the Lord is good and the Lord is great and the Lord will save those who come to Him. So we ought to live with the light of His first coming in a way that honors God. Uh, we also see that it's a mistake for people to waste their lives uh, thinking that, well, I'm saved, so I'll just wait around and, and not do anything and not show my appreciation to God. That is certainly not the way to live. And those who profess Christ as Lord should live according to their profession. I don't know how many hundreds of people that I have known down through the years of my salvation since 1978. And there have been some that I've seen saved who have grown and produced great fruit. And then there are others that never darken the house of God, never read their Bible. They live like the world. They talk like the world. Their life has not changed. And it certainly brings into question whether or not their lives were ever saved, uh, their souls were ever saved in the beginning. The Bible tells us that if it were possible, uh, that even the very elect can be deceived. Mark 13 uh, warns us about that. We won't go and read that. I'm sure you've heard it read before in Mark, 5, Mark 13, 5 through 22. He talks about how that if it were possible, the very elect could be, saved, could be deceived. But because you have the Spirit of God in your heart, you're led by truth. And the Bible warns us in 2 Thessalonians 2 to not let anybody deceive you in any way. I've had people tell me that there is no salvation, that there is no God. The day, just a couple days after I was saved, an engineer who was one of my best friends, and I'd known him for a long time, when he heard I became a Christian, he made it a point to bring me in his house, and he preached to me that there was no God, that he that all of it was a man's imagination and that all I was doing was following some foolish fairy tale. And I didn't say nothing because I was very young in the faith, but that man really had a big impact on me. And for a few days, I felt so discouraged. But the Spirit of God kept working in my heart, and even though He tried to lead me astray, the Lord Jesus caused me to walk in His ways and turn from that doubt and those lies. Amen. We must discern.
The Bible also reminds us that we must be discerning in these times. Twice, Mark 13 warned his disciples, don't be led astray by false claims, for there will be many who will say, I am Christ, and lo, here is Christ. But do not be deceived, because these are false prophets. Paul warned, uh, saying that when Jesus his coming approaches and will be gathered to him. Let no one deceive you in any way. So the scripture is consistent in telling us that we ought to pray about everything. And not everybody who tells you they're a Christian are truly Christians. And not everybody who says they're saved know the Bible. The devil is a great architect in deceiving people. I saw a man on YouTube who, who told some of the biggest lies I've ever heard in my life. He's a Baptist preacher. He's an Oriental guy. And I, I couldn't believe some of the things he was, he was trying to teach. They were just lie after lie after lie. And there were people in the congregation going, Amen! 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 And he was preaching heresy that was so blind and misleading. But you see, people want to hear something tantalizing. Something that tickles their ears and causes them uh, uh, to follow after such a man. We need to remember that uncertainties are real. Uh, we don't know exactly when the Lord will return. Uh, we believe it's very soon. But we are to watch and be alert. And every day we're to live our lives and, and remind ourselves that today could be the day. And then also don't lose hope. Paul reminded Titus that Jesus' first coming brought salvation and its instructions on how to live a righteous and godly life in this present age. The second coming is our blessed hope. The expectation of His return compels us, Titus wrote in chapter 2, verse 11 and 13. And then we ought to encourage one another. The promise that the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 is followed by a command. Listen, therefore encourage one another with these words. He's coming again. I was uh, on my walker. I was going in a store and this little lady was all bent over and she could barely walk. And I went up to her and patted her on the back and uh, asked her if I could pray with her. And she said, yes. I prayed with her. And she looked at me and she said, one day I won't be all bent over and crippled. She said, one day I'll have a new body. And that's all that keeps me going. And I thought to myself, Lord, that woman just encouraged my heart. Because in this world there is suffering. In this world there is pain. There are troubles and heartaches. But a day's coming when all that will be put away. He's going to wipe away all tears from our eyes because you imagine the tears that will flow when we see loved ones cast into the lake of fire and he would have to take the tears from our eyes or we, we wouldn't be able to live he'd have to remove it from our heart and mind and he'll do that so that we can enjoy that glorious place so therefore encourage one another and edify one another he says in 1 Thessalonians 5 2 through 11 and the Bible teaches about the second coming are given not to satisfy some sort of fascination with the future. You have all these uh, uh, pastors and preachers that are selling thousands upon thousands of books and they call themselves prophecy experts and people flock to that sort of thing. I had a lady contact me on the, uh, through a text and she told me she went to a prophecy con, uh, uh, meeting and that this man was supposed to be an expert 
And I asked her, I said, well, what would you learn? She said, to tell you the truth, I'm more confused than I've ever been in my life. And I said, I want to tell you something. When you, when you find somebody who claims to be an expert, run just as far away from them as you can. Because most of the time, they're not experts at all. They've just come up with something that they've conceived on their own rather than the Word of God. The fact is, we do not know when our Lord will return. Uh, not even the Son knows. Right. Now, maybe we can know the day and the time by looking at what the Bible says as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating and they were drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and there was all sorts of corruptness. We know that every thought of man's heart was evil continually and we're fastly approaching that. Thank God there still are righteous people who love the Lord and who stand for His Word and I believe that God takes note of that. So live today as if the Lord would come back today. If we're not careful, the delay in His return can lead us to complacency. Remember, uh, the Bible says, Peter says that in the last days, scoffers shall come. And they, they'll say, where is His coming? You know, when will the day come? And, and they'll, they'll make up all sorts of things. And we know that from the past that people have lied about it from the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and uh, Mary Baker Eddy and different ones and the Seven Day at Venice. They've all set dates and prophesied He was coming and He didn't come and then they lied and said, well, He didn't come uh, physically, but He came spiritually. Tried to explain away their lies. But anybody who tells you they know the day and the hour when He's coming, they're telling you something that the Bible says only the Father knows. And I would also say that looking at the coming of the Lord encourages us to keep on going. Keep on living your life. Keep on fighting the good fight. Jesus warned us as the end comes, there will be troublesome events that will take place. On YouTube, I watched a program that showed what happened between July the 19th and uh, the, the last couple days. And it showed all the floods and earthquakes and fires and, I mean, just terrible things happening all around the world. And it reminded me of the fact that with all these things that are occurring, we ought to be reminded and so hopeful that the Lord Jesus is coming soon. So keep on living your life for Him. Mark 13, 7 and 9 uh, tells us that we may even be persecuted, we may suffer a great loss, but this should not distract us. Before ascending into heaven, Jesus told the disciples that He wanted them to uh, do His work and they were to go into all the world and they were to make disciples, preach the gospel, then baptize them and teach them to observe all things and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. We believe that promise. Amen. That's why we keep on preaching the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and continue to warn the lost that our Savior will come soon. In the book of Acts chapter 1, the Lord said, But you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth in Acts 1.8. And the very next report, verse reports that the disciples just stood there looking into the sky, and then the angels appeared and spoke the words to them and told them, Why are you standing here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus shall so come in like manner. So we ought to get busy. When was the last time you shared the gospel with a lost person? When was the last time we earnestly prayed and wept for the lost? 
When was the last time coming to church you cried from your heart and said, Oh God, save the lost. Oh God, please. I remember many years ago when I got saved, my dad was lost and my mom was lost, my sisters. And I would pray, I'd, I'd get by my dad's door and I'd pray for him while he was in bed that God would save him. And I would just, my heart was so intent on my dad being saved and my mom. And I remember after witnessing to him, he told me to get out of the house. He didn't want to hear me, didn't want to talk to me. And uh, so I left home for a few days. I came back and I said, Dad, I, I only care about you and I love you. That's why I try to talk to you about your soul. And that next Sunday, I saw my dad weeping in the service as the pastor preached the gospel. And he came. He got down on his one leg. He had his leg blown off. and He asked the Lord Jesus to come into his heart. And what a wonderful day it was when my, my dad was saved. And then my mom was saved and my sisters. And I saw people get saved. And every time that the Lord saves someone, my heart rejoices. There's nothing that blesses my soul more than to see one of His saints come home. The Lord Jesus is coming. And we need to be looking for that. Don't, don't live in fear. Some people are so full of fear and uh, fright. But we don't have to be afraid when our Lord comes. He's going to receive us in peace. He said in John 14, when He told the disciples, He said, Be not troubled. Uh, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to come in like manner. And He told them that uh, uh, this same Jesus was going to come again. And He reminded us to continue to serve Him. Let not our hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Paul said in Philippians 1, to go and be with the Lord is far better. He was in a strait between two. And Paul spoke of the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't be full of fear, but anticipate with great joy the coming of the Lord. And I want to close with the final words of the great servant of God, uh, John, when he said in the closing verse of Revelation, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come. Jesus is coming again. And I pray that you're prepared and ready to meet Him. Heavenly Father, thank You today for Your precious Word. Thank You for the promises of Your coming. Help us to live each day with that in our minds and hearts, knowing that our deliverance will soon come. Father, I pray for your will to be done upon this earth as it is in heaven. And if there be a soul here today that needs the Lord Jesus, may the Holy Spirit lead them to the water of life and the bread of heaven. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Let's all stand please. Brother Chapman, Kathy, if you'll come to lead us.